Okay, I hope you all had a good lunch and are full of energy for our next topic, um, Parents in the NICU. And we'll have two lectures on that, first the physician side and then we'll have the parent side and then we'll have the discussion at the end of all that. That's fine. Okay, so the um, floor is yours, Stina, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. And the invitation was actually not for me in the first place. It was for Bjorn Vester, who arrived just now to the lecture here. Uh, but I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and we're going into the soft values, soft, soft spots of the neonatal care. Um, the parents, the family, the infant with the infant with uh, its parents. This triad. Better? No? Better? Yes? You can go, yeah, and set down some being carrying me a more normal. Better? No? Maybe Francesco. No? Okay. So this triad that we uh, have to step very, very carefully not to disturb. Uh, and usually the picture doesn't look like this. It looks like this. With staff members, with machines that go bing, and everything is very stressful. And to be able to keep this very calm, um, area just around the baby and the parents and of course we have to do our abcs we have to save lives we have to intubate a baby who doesn't breathe uh, as for this baby a girl that was as asphyxiated uh, after a show of the dystonia, uh, dystocia and uh, but at the age of 30 minutes she was uh, extubated and we could put her re reunite her with her mother and at this charge, one week later, these parents, they didn't remember the first 30 minutes. They remembered these 15 minutes of being together. And this has a huge impact, I believe, in the future for this family and the baby. The Convention of the Right of the Child uh, states that the child uh, has the right to be cared for by his parents and that no child should be separated from his parents um, <coughs> against their will, and of course that's not their will. And to care for the children, for the infants uh, in this way, uh, is to see the infant as an individual and to recognize that it's actually a human being, even though uh, it's small, <laughs> of course. Uh, and also to encourage the nursing staff to, to um, see the individual infant and family and their uh, needs. Uh, to, I, I named this, um, this um, 30 minutes uh, to be developmentally supported care and family-centered care. And, uh, but it's mostly about fa the family-centered part. So if you want to uh, dig deeper into the developmentally supported care, and also the history of the family-centered care uh, in the Western part of, of uh, uh, civilization. Uh, you could uh, go into these webcasts uh, and you could just Google Kerlinska and Ultra Early and you will find them. Uh, and there you have my, many interesting uh, lectures. And there are some names of importance for uh, interesting studies. Uh, there has been many studies that support the practice of infant and family-centered developmentally supported care and family-centered care. And in our setting, uh, it's very difficult to separate these two principles. Uh, and um, you could easily find this Davidson, where, uh, which is recently published, uh, where they have guidelines for family-centered care in both infants and in uh, adults in ICU. And also the eight principles of patient-centered family, uh, patient-centered and family-centered, well, maybe that was wrong, uh, care uh, for newborns, 
uh, and that is a work that is done from uh, EFCNI, which Bjorn is very um, uh, doing a lot of work with. And they are trying to get standards of care in, this, uh, in these principles and closing the gap between evidence and uh, practice. And they stated these eight principles for family-centered care, that there should be a free 24-hour day uh, parental access with no limits of staff shifts or medical rounds, and psychological support for parents, pain management. We heard uh, yesterday that this can be uh, a challenge in many ways, uh, but to have a program like um, a principles to manage pain uh, somehow, even if we don't know if it's the correct way. Uh, supportive environment uh, in the concept of sound, light and sleep, postural support, skin to skin contact, breastfeeding and lactation support and sleep protection for the baby. Infant and family centered developmentally supportive care is actually to see the newborn as an individual and to do this we have to integrate natural sciences with behavioral sciences. The behavior is uh, the infant's primary way to communicate. And this is stated very nicely uh, by Heidi Als, who is the founder of the NIDCAP program. Um, another part of these um, principles is the communication with the parents, with the family. And here I have um, a must read from Bjorn. Uh, the book from Zach Bukidis, uh, the late Zach Bukidis, uh, that we recommend for, for this subject. Uh, Heidi Lizaus uh, also uh, did this, um, this model of systems perspective where we have the infant in the middle, the parents around, the family, extended family, but around this is an, uh, the NICU system and the hospital system and also uh, the community system. And we can never separate these entirely from each other because they will always affect each other. So a change, something disappeared there. Uh, a change in one of the systems will always run down to the infant or to the, to the family. So political decisions, uh, structural changes in the society, shortage of nurses or shortage of bed, beds will always come down to the patient. We have a positive um, development in this, uh, in this sense. Uh, during the last 30 years in Sweden, we had a very um, nice development of the parental benefits in Sweden. So from 1974 to uh, today, the same level, uh, we increased these days enormously and we now have 480 days for the parents, which is uh, very unique. And that makes us, of course, uh, have the parents around us, around the baby, in the unit, which is not possible for many uh, countries. <coughs> And if, we, uh, if I just tell you a little bit about uh, the neonatal departments in Stockholm. So we are divided uh, into four units. So it's this hospital, so the Fukuset, South Hospital, and then it's Karolinska University Hospital with three different um, departments or houses or units, we don't know what to call it, down to the and Solna, with different level of ICU um, and ICUs. And actually, one out of four children in Sweden are born in Stockholm. We have about 30,000 deliveries a year. Uh, we have 65 to 70 beds out of the 105, approximately, that was um, originally there. But all of them are not open because of staffing problems. And of course, we have a close collaboration with, between the units. And these are pictures from Dandrid. The NICU system is very important, how you design it, how you construct it, uh, to be able to have the family there. And in all our units here in Sweden, we have, um, 
we never have single rooms. We have family rooms or uh, a larger room with several patients, two, two, four, uh, where there's always staff members or parents. So most often parents, but if they're not there, the staff members can help the child. This is it at Dandarid, uh, where the parents, where we try to get a little private spot for these parents with their twins. So if the parents are not there, staff members can help the child if needed. And here, the open door there is uh, to an adjacent family room where this father and, and the baby's mother also have their uh, room. And when the baby is more stable, the baby will move into this family room. This is the family room. It looks very nice here. Like a hotel room with a private shower and toilet. And this is from Hudine where parents have a room en suite behind every NICU space. <coughs> and this is the very brand new uh, unit at Solna, uh, where there is a nursing area and then four different, four bed spaces uh, next to it, like this, and with uh, room for a bed for the parent. Not to sleep, to stay overnight, but to be there as much as they want. And then uh, just um, a few doors away from the ICU room uh, are the parents' room. Uh, as long as the baby is in critical care, the parents can be here in the same unit. Again, <coughs> from uh, I show these pictures because I think it's important to show that it doesn't have to be ugly, it doesn't have to be a very strange and uh, scary uh, environment. Uh, it can be um, sort of familiar uh, and nice environment for the parents uh, to be in. And I think that they will be there more if the environment looks like this. This is a kitchen for the parents where they can have breakfast, uh, included breakfast, and they can cook themselves to bring food and cook. Uh, or nowadays they can actually also buy some ready meals in these fridges and freezers. So coming down to the topic for the day, uh, the family and the parents. Uh, it's important that the whole family is included uh, and is, um, has the possibility to visit this tiny little child uh, and to get to know to know the sibling or the grandchild. We now have, um, it's, siblings can visit the, the units uh, all year round. We don't, earlier we had a, a ban for uh, siblings below the age of 12, but it's now taken away. So they just have to be healthy, not having a, a, a cold or anything, and they can come visit. They can even stay for the night, but it's quite boring to be in a room uh, 24 hours uh, for a two or three year old. So most often they just visit together, maybe, maybe with a parent, one of the parents or a grandparent. We try to keep the family together like this. The, these uh, parents have triplets. The father there has two children on his chest. We have a lot of skin-to-skin -skin care, uh, and we actually have eight and a half hours a day at the Dandrit unit. And that was, uh, we had one um, measurement of that earlier, but we have a, a newly, um, a new measurement in the SCENE uh, study. some nice pictures of siblings. Even in the critical care unit. And I got the question um, when I was in, in Dublin recently, um, if we did skin to skin care with siblings. And it's not anything that we encourage, 
but it is there. It is. This was just when I was doing my daily rounds, and this very proud big brother Pontus had his little sister on his chest. We need to, uh, to actively think about keeping the family together. If we, we just proceed in our normal, uh, normal ways, uh, most often we separate the families in some, help, in some way. Um, there are a lot of definitions and words to uh, explain the, fa the concept of family-centered care. Uh, there is a, a special program that is called Family Integrated Care, and that was um, that was uh, invented, actually founded in uh, Canada, and they have actually also done a randomised trial. Uh, I have not actually read the the article. Maybe you have your comment on that later on. But we have the close collaboration program. And we have a humane uh, neonatal care initiative. We have the other name that we most often use is the infant and family centered care. And we want to point out that you can never uh, rule out the infant in all this. It, you can't concentrate only on the family, only on the parents. You have to always have the baby in the center. And then to put the developmentally supportive care uh, after, and that is, for example, the NIDCAP program, which includes these, uh, these different aspects. Uh, and then we have the special, uh, special word, couplet care. And I'll show you what that is. So a majority of mothers at Kerlinska uh, are cared for within the concept of couplet care. And this can be organized in many ways, and we have tried a few of these different uh, ways of organi to organize it. Uh, but the way we do it at the moment is uh, that midwives from the maternity ward comes over to the neonatal unit and care for the mothers there. And we need then large rooms with proper hospital beds because the mother can actually uh, bleed or have any other um, emergency complications uh, and has to be rushed away to the OR or something like this. We cannot care for mothers who need intensive care. Another way of keeping the family together and keeping the parents close to the baby from the very start is to actually stabilize the baby with the parent. Uh, in this, this picture, you see that the resuscitating table there is not used. This is a 33 or 34 weeker a boy. I can't remember exactly his gestational age, uh, but he was put straight away from the cesarean to the father's chest. And we have this uh, portable. Uh, there was a. An American woman yesterday having a word for it. I don't have the, the English trolley. word. The trolley. Trolley. Yeah. Portable NICU trolley. We call it our NICU. So a NICU bridge to bridge over from the delivery ward or uh, <coughs> OR to uh, the NICU with all the uh, things that we need to stabilize the baby. And from this, we have taken it one step further. So uh, with the initiative from John Vestrup, uh, there is now a gigantic study uh, that is starting. We have done a pilot between 2014 and 16. It's called EPISTOS, Immediate Parent Infant Skin to Skin Study. Uh, <coughs> we will very soon, or we have started as like a soft launch in uh, one of our, uh, our centers. But we will, uh, the plan is to include 5,000 infants. Uh, it is now run by WHO and founded by the Lemon and the Gates Foundation and Lair Lairdorf, uh, also with Ladar fundings. Uh, we have three different arms, like low uh, and middle income countries, where uh, we will, uh, our main outcome is mortality or survival and uh, a mechanistic middle-income country uh, arm with South Africa and Vietnam and a high-income uh, income country arm with only mechanistic um, uh, well, 
it's called the mechanism. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't find the words in English. So that is Sweden and Norway. Uh, and otherwise, it's mostly centers in Africa. Uh, so, can we uh, change the cascade of things happening for the, these tiny little babies uh, that lead to morbidity and also to mortality? Can we improve, improve uh, the outcomes in the long run? Uh, these are for babies. Uh, the, the study uh, will include babies from week 28 plus 0 to 32 plus 6. Here we are at Dundrid, uh, waiting for a 29 plus 0 boy being born, born vaginally. The father is prepared to be able to, uh, to take the boy on his chest after stabilization, hopefully with the mother. Actually, this boy was very sick when he came out, so he was rushed to the uh, resuscitating table. Uh, so we have <coughs> other examples of babies that we did stabilize um, with the parents. Uh, this is actually an aunt, uh, because the father was on his way to work, uh, from work and didn't make it in time, and the mother had a severe preeclampsia. The baby had good vital signs. There was a delayed cord clamping, and the nasal CPAP was put on at one minute of age on the chest of the aunt. And um, electrodes and saturation monitor put on. Uh, a special wool cloth um, was is covered. We covered the baby with this black wool uh, cloth, and. Uh, some other materials that we have found that is very good for keeping the temperature. And off we went at 20 minutes of age. There is snow outside, as you can see. And the weight of it, uh, this boy was 1,354 grams. There is an anecdote that uh, he still sleeps very well with his aunt. <laughs> and this girl, 1.7 kilo, 31 plus 3, she stayed skin to skin directly after birth, uh, the first 20 minutes. And the CPAP comes on, of course, before the cord is clamped. And after 20 minutes, the mother felt very sick. So we moved the baby to the father's <coughs> chest instead. Uh, but then we stayed in the room for yet another 20 minutes. So the family was together for 40 minutes before the mother had to go to the OR and have her placenta removed manually. Another boy, 1,522 grams, also put to the, to the mother, skin to skin, for 20 minutes. We talked earlier today about the importance of having uh, the supply of breast milk, the mother's own breast milk. And I think that this is a very good example of how we can actually get the mother to produce breast milk. Look at this mother watching her newborn baby boy. Uh, and the love that she gets in her eyes and all these hormones that will flow, I think that she will get more milk supply, a better milk supply. But that's just uh, a thought, and we will see in the EPISTA study if we have, um, if we're right. Parents need to feel happiness over their, the birth of their child, and we should Think very. Think about this uh, once in a while, and try not to take that away from them. So to minimize separation, include the parents from the start. Support and guide and inform each parent on the basis of their needs and abilities. And all parents are different. And they have different needs, and different abilities. Facilitate parent and infant interaction, bonding and attachment, and have an individualized developmental support in caregiving and environment to infants and parents. To reunite the mother and the baby as soon as possible. Here she comes from probably a cesarean section, uh, straight up for, to the NICU. The baby has Often central uh, catheters, uh, but can still be moved to the chest of the mother, not skin to skin, but very close. 
one and a half day old with the milk catheter. And as you see, it's a tiny bit of skin to skin contact. And very happy parents. <coughs> the closeness has to be uh, at the level of the infant's current stability, of course. This baby has a gastroschisis and could not be removed from the incubator. But the mother's bed, as you see, is raised up so that she is very close to her baby. We do skin-to-skin -skin care uh, also with the uh, oscillator ventilator. Uh, I often get that question, but we do that. I have a, a movie when these babies are actually grabbing hold of the mother's breast, breastfeeding for about a minute, and they are really tiny, one kilo each. I want to show you that. Uh, to help the parents, I think if we just reflect on these, these very wise words some, from time to time, that will help us. If one is truly to succeed in leading a person to a specific place, one must first and foremost take care to find him where he is and begin there. This is why we don't have special educational programs for parents in the NICU here. Uh, we have to find these parents where they are and start there. So you can never have this class of parents and educate them in needed care. A proud father putting on the first diaper. I actually almost smacked the fingers of a nurse trying to put the first diaper on. This is the job for a father. And they're so proud. Most of them. It's easy with a big baby. Uh, <coughs> with the smaller babies, parents are often quite scared and don't know how to, to get up close to try to do the first take the first steps and we have to guide and coach and sometimes we need to really do this hands on. The, the hands close to us here is a staff member and the other one is the father touching his baby for the first time. Parents want to do the baby stuff. They want to feed, weigh their baby, change the diapers, wash, comfort, carry, cuddle, all these things. And even if the baby is sick, even if the baby is really tiny, these are things that can be done and will be done. And it should not be done by staff members. It should be done by the child parents. Parents giving a baby a bath with the help from staff or only with the guidance of staff. If you do this in the right way, uh, right way, is the right way? I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> if, you, if you plan your work, this will not take more time. It can be very tempting to help this father of triplets when he's about to wash his babies. But he wants to do it himself. And he will do it in his way. The parents' presence also make the care become more developmentally supportive. The parents will tune in on the baby's behavior. They are there 24-7, hopefully, or at least much more than any staff member. They will know their child, and they can um, adapt the, the care to their specific child and what the child uh, shows in their behavior. We also have parents taking active part in ward rounds. This can look very differently in different settings and in, in from different from day to day on a day to day, -to -day basis. So these parents, they had just put their babies to bed. They had fed them and they were sleeping in their bed. So they came up to the uh, to the what do you call nursing station and the computer with the Dr. Marco. Uh, but in other situations, 
this is how it can look with the father sitting skin to skin with his baby. Uh, we're doing the board rounds and we're asking him some questions or giving him some information, but in a way that will not disturb uh, the child or the, the um, skin to skin session, so to say. Uh, and of course, you have to be very careful in not careful not to have a loud. Um, speak loud and, and to disturb the other children in, in this um, ICU room. For confidentiality, we sometimes use these headphones with music for the other parents. And ward rounds in family rooms. We walk around with a, a portable computer and um, there is a recommendation, sitting down. Uh, to, to show the parents that I have time for you now, this is your, your time. So what do you want to ask us today, what do you want to tell me about your child? Uh, and after some discussion we have a plan for the day or a plan for a week, whatever. And I found uh, that this um, was uh, this evidence-based <laughs> practice since I found some uh, evidence for this being a good practice in these articles. Um, there are some challenges. This is a new way of working for many. We have done it now for quite a long time. Uh, but to implement this, you have to take very small steps and you have to do it your own way. <coughs> At Karolinska, we have this process started 20, some 20 years ago. So it will take a long time. Uh, and you have to be flexible and willing to question routines. We also, you also have to be confident in your monitoring system. And um, I will come to that in, a, in another slide. And also to, it can be a challenge to meet the families in their private sphere. They are living there and some parents, they live there for five months. So, of course, that would be their private room. And it puts some, uh, some extra, you have to put some extra thought in the planning and in the communication. This is how it can look in a private family room. <laughs> Persian New Year, I don't know. We have a wireless telemetry system that allows safe mobile monitoring. Uh, so, in the family rooms, the monitor is black for the parents and no alarms are heard that is, will disturb the babies. And parents are guided to look at their children instead of a monitor. We have some different tools for this. One is the scale of well-being and stress or pain. It is actually validated as a pain scale, but we use it more often now as a well-being or stress scale. And in progress, it's a hedonic scale. So if you uh, see this one here, the Alps Neo, uh, if you instead put minus one and minus two here for the, the stressed baby, and then you would have on the other side plus one and plus two for something that is pleasurable, that is uh, being validated at the moment. Uh, I think I will skip this one because I'm running out of time. Uh, and this is also one of our tools to communicate with the parents how much support they would like to have in different aspects of the care of their child. Coming down to the infant, what does this infant tell us? Um, we have to do uh, what, uh, as much as we possibly can to make the future bright for this baby. It is the fetus and we have to adapt the environment to the fact that this baby is actually not ready to come up yet. And the surroundings in the NICU can never be um, compared to the environment in the uterus. But we have to try. And incorrect stimuli can cause incorrect connections and function. We know that from several different studies, um, that the fine tuning and the differentiation of our ner nervous system uh, is 
uh, affected by the environment and what the baby uh, meets after birth. This is becoming increasingly important since smaller and smaller babies survive. 80% of babies born below 28 weeks survive in Sweden today. Um, there are, as I said, several <coughs> studies. This is one study uh, that showed MRI changes uh, or that we could protect uh, the baby's brain by having mid-cap care instead of conventional care. And similar findings were uh, done by uh, the group in Melbourne, in <coughs> MITP, which is similar to mid-cap, but started later on. Another study that showed that uh, growth-restricted babies, is, uh, they were uh, at school age, uh, or there were two groups, mid-cap care and uh, conventional care, and at school age, they had to copy this, this picture. Uh, oh, it was very easy. Uh, so this is trying to copy the picture when you see it, uh, and recall how it looked, and after some minutes, recall it again. And you see the control group up there, their short-term memory and, um, and executive functioning is not as good. So we can change the future for these children. We believe that NTEP is uh, so far the most comprehensive program for development is su developmentally supported care and family-centered care. And this reduced stress behaviors, increased self-regulatory behaviors, and also <coughs> guide parents. I will not go into this. This is the um, principle of synaction, uh, which this program uh, is based on. Um, so, uh, self-regulatory behaviors and co-regulation is very important for the baby. And this is what we do as staff members, but also what the parents can do for their baby. Um, to hold the baby to... Um, to <laughs> care for the baby. Yeah, I will show you some more pictures coming here. But this um, this makes the baby have a better resilience during examinations and uh, in caregiving. So here, uh, to hold the baby during uh, painful procedures or stressful procedures like cranial ultrasound or just a normal eye examination which is not so very pleasant. All of these, um, how we work, will uh, eventually make the parents feel uh, confident caring for their child, and we will be able to discharge the baby and the parents quite early from the ward. and we encourage skin-to-skin -skin contact also after discharge and these very special baby carriers that we lend out to the parents also when they are discharged to the home care. We have an early discharge program, uh, home care system for tube feeding and weaning to promote breastfeeding, uh, but also for oxygen cannulas and phototherapy for term babies or special needs. Oops. Yes. Uh, we have quite a high, to compare it to other centers, we have quite a high uh, incidence of breastfeeding for, also for, for preterm babies. And usually it takes a long time, so at about 36 to 38 weeks, that's when you can expect the baby to be able to breastfeed. And about one third to half of our patients are at any given time in the home care system instead of uh, at the ward. We don't have a weight limit, but instead it's autonomically stable babies uh, and confident parents. This is usually around late in week 33 or week 34. Sometimes for uh, very low gestational ages, it's more about term age. 
We have seen in the two trials that we have done here in Stockholm, the Stockholm Family Centered Care Study and the Stockholm Midcap Trial, that we have a lot to gain uh, in this way of working. We have a shorter length of stay in hospital, uh, reduced short time mobility with BPD and uh, CPAP days and oxygen days, less, less anxiety with mothers and higher incidence of breastfeeding. That was not significant by the trend. We also have better head growth, which can be um, argued to have maybe um, implications for the future for the baby. We also have observational studies of lower incidence of healthcare associated infections. We are now planning uh, to have a continued developmentally supportive care after discharge with, to support the sensitive parenting. And well, I skip this, but this, these are programs that have also looked at uh, developmental support to families after discharge. So the IBAIP and the MITP, uh, and also the top program. But they're all based on the same uh, grounds, which is uh, sort of the NIDCAP program or the Brazil Clinic. 